right, we are into our, our next session here. Uh, I would love to introduce our speaker today. He's got 40 years in exchange alternatives uh, and alternative finance. He's the author of many books, including The End of Money and The Future of Civilization. He's been an IRTA speaker veteran, speaking many years, including keynoting in 2016. And in 2016, 14 years ago, he said uh, many of the things he's going to say were, uh, today were true then, and they're even more true now. He's the creator of the Beyond Money website. You should subscribe to that. Let's put your hands together. Put them in the air for Tom Greco. Look at that, Tom. Ron giving you some love, showing your book on camera. Thank you so much. One of the best books ever written about our industry. <laughs> wow, that's, that's big from Ron. Well, great. Thank you very much, John. And thank you, Ron, for inviting me once again to participate in the IRTA convention. I consider it a great privilege uh, for me to be able to rub shoulders with people that have been in the trenches for many years and have really learned how to do it on the ground and how to make uh, credit available and create liquidity for small and medium-sized businesses especially. So um, with that, I want to talk a bit about uh, the general situation that we're confronted with today. And I'm going to bring up a, a slideshow for you uh, that I will talk through. So I've titled the show, Get Ready to Play in the Butterfly Economy. And uh, I've used this metaphor before, and uh, I'll tell you why in a little while. But uh, Basically, let me go through what happens in this metamorphic process. It begins with an egg that a female butterfly lays on, an, on a leaf. And uh, after a couple days, the egg hatches, the caterpillar climbs out and starts to eat the leaf and then moves on to eat other leaves. And the caterpillar basically only does that. It eats and it grows, it eats and it grows, it eats and it grows. And uh, I remember when I lived in the, the Northeast, oftentimes in the spring, seeing these uh, trees covered with webs uh, with the tent caterpillars just uh, engulfing the whole tree. And I often wondered how a tree might be able to survive uh, having such an infestation. And then in my own gardening experience, both in uh, New York and here in Arizona, I've had uh, encounters with what they call tomato hornworms. They're the big green caterpillars that well, they're about the size of your thumb. And they can completely defoliate a tomato plant or a pepper plant uh, in a matter of hours. And uh, it often uh, amazed me that even though that happened, well, I intervened somewhat to remove them, but uh, the plants generally survived that. Uh, the thing is that uh, this only goes on for a certain period of time. At some point, the caterpillar knows that it's time to stop. And then it either spins a cocoon, a web around its body, or a shell hardens around its body. And what happens then is the, the caterpillar body disintegrates. It breaks down into what biologists call a nutrient soup. And this soup is actually uh, uh, the availability of nutrients for what they call imaginal cells. Now these cells were already in the caterpillar body from the beginning, but they were dormant until this period of time in the chrysalis stage where the imaginal cells begin to multiply and, and join together uh, to form the organs and the limbs and the, uh, the body of the new butterfly. So when that process is complete, uh, the shell cracks open, the butterfly uh, comes out, spreads its wings and flies away. But the behavior of the butterfly is completely different from the caterpillar. While the caterpillar behavior seemed to be quite destructive in the process of eating and growing, uh, what a butterfly does is it flies around, it harvests nectar, from flowers, so instead of destroying the plant, it actually helps the plant to propagate itself by cross-pollinating. And then the uh, female butterflies have sex with the males and they lay eggs on leaves and the, 
the cycle begins all over again. So the question is, how is this relevant to today's situation um, and to your business? Well, I think it's obvious that uh, we have a global meta crisis or mega crisis that's been ongoing for quite a long time. It's at once economic, social, political, and environmental. You know, we see the end of cheap energy. We see resource depletion on all fronts. We see pollution in many different forms. We see climate change. We see financial disruption with bankruptcies, unemployment, currency debasement, endless debt growth, concentration of wealth and power, which is increasing ever more as time goes on. Uh, we're losing our freedoms, freedom to move, to speak, to communicate, freedom to think even. And we're seeing spreading social unrest, wars, and a general failure of our institutions and systems. And now with the uh, COVID pandemic, we've had uh, <coughs> another monkey wrench thrown into the works. And uh, we were told initially that uh, our job was to flatten the curve, which would take two or three months. Uh, then we've been told that uh, the job is to stop the spread, which might take six to eight months. And now we're being told that we need to wait for the vaccine so that we can have mass inoculations to protect us from this COVID virus. Well, I'm asking, what if this is the new normal? What if there is no getting over this crisis? You know, we have the, uh, the winter flu season coming up uh, in just a, a few weeks, and uh, this may cause uh, further need or arguments for need uh, to keep the economy shut down to keep uh, wearing masks, to keep social distancing, to keep markets closed. So some people are uh, arguing that the response of governments to this COVID pandemic, uh, social distancing, market closures, which have devastated many industries, uh, that these are worse than the actual disease itself. And different governments have responded differently uh, to the situation. Uh, Sweden is one situation which uh, requires a special note. Uh, they didn't do the social distancing quite as severely as other countries, and we need to look at the results that they managed to uh, encounter. So with the face-to-face uh, -face markets being increasingly closed, uh, this has had a tremendous impact, especially in in retail, on the travel and hospitality and entertainment industries, uh, restaurants, bars, gyms, personal services have been closed and uh, it's very difficult for those companies to survive. And if this goes on for very long, uh, we're gonna see a massive closure of small and medium-sized businesses uh, that are permanent. Well, the other thing that we note is that markets are increasingly going online platform businesses and networks are the ones that are thriving. And we've seen how that's uh, emerged over the last 15 or 20 years with the giants of Google, Amazon, eBay, PayPal, Facebook, Apple, Uber, and other platform businesses. So the question that I pose is where is civilization headed? What's going to be the new normal? Uh, right now, things are looking pretty dark uh, we seem to be headed toward uh, disintegration and collapse with people uh, being increasingly in conflict with one another, uh, having different opinions on, uh, on what needs to be done. So we could have a new dark age, which is uh, this greed, selfishness, separation. will be frozen and not do anything that needs to be done. So I'm looking at a societal metamorphosis, new golden age based, I hope, on generosity, compassion, cooperation, solidarity, and across the board restructuring 
of our systems and metastructures. Now, I take a page from Alvin Toffler's book. He wrote a book a few years ago called The Third Wave. And he said that the first wave was the agricultural age, what was all about growing things. And then that transitioned into the industrial age, which was all about making things. And uh, now he posits that we're ready for a third wave, what I call the convivial wave, which is not about things at all. It's more about being and less about doing. So we're on the cusp of this change, which I see as the civilizational metamorphosis. So the old caterpillar economy is dying. It was driven primarily by a money system that was based on compound interest and lending money into circulation at interest, which causes a growth imperative. And uh, this is what's been driving this growth for the last 300 years. It's been enabled by the availability of cheap fossil fuel energy. Without that, this could not have gone on as long as it has. So the caterpillar economy with these drivers and enablers have promoted continuous growth of economic output, quantitative measures of value and well-being, the privatization of resources and capital accumulation, particularly in the hands of mega corporations, uh, resource consumption and competition for control, uh, the productivity of labor that is trying to get more value out of each unit of labor, uh, growing disparities of wealth and power, massive scale and increasingly massive scale, which is the consumer society. What I envision as the new butterfly economy, which is waiting to be born, is being driven by an interest-free moneyless exchange system. And this is where you come in primarily. This is being enabled by sharing, human solidarity, compassion, and mutual respect. And the characteristics that uh, this economy promotes are steady state economic output. We have to stop this continual growth. Measures of uh, well-being that are qualitative instead of quantitative. Uh, we need to restore the commons. We need to, re uh, we need to emphasize resource productivity that is getting more value out of each unit of material input, and we need to focus on restoring the environment. Uh, also, more equitable distribution of power and wealth needs to be a priority, and we need to operate at a human scale. This is what I call the convivial society. So the big question is, how can we make it successfully through the chrysalis stage? How can we transcend the systems of the old caterpillar economy that we have become dependent upon? Uh, I think a large part of it is going to be learning how to walk away from those systems and to create new systems. We need to identify who and what are the imaginal cells in our society that need to come together and work together to create the new systems and structures. And what are the characteristics of these new systems that are required for civilization to survive and for the future generations to thrive? Well, I'm looking at the new emerging networked economy. And I'm harking back here to my 2006 keynote at the ERTA convention, where I talked about uh, a decentralized yet globally in interlinked economy, where value is increasingly based on intangibles, ideas, information, and relationships, where information is widely available, flowing freely, which dissolves geographic barriers, social barriers, political and economic barriers. And uh, uh, a business model that's increasingly web based. So we're seeing all sectors are being increasingly connected and communicating. And this is what we have to build upon. 
So uh, here I'm expressing my opinions about what business trade exchanges are really in. It's my opinion that the primary value of trade exchange membership is not in the access it provides to small exclusive markets. Trade exchanges are not in the barter business. You know, it's not a matter of arranging uh, customers to trade on a barter basis, which we saw earlier uh, in Dr. Lee's presentation uh, is highly limited to a coincidence, coincidence of wants and needs. What I argue is that commercial trade exchanges are in the business of enabling the moneyless exchange of real values that is providing liquidity that's independent of the money and banking system. And when we start to look at it in that way, then we see the direction that we need to go in. Right now, the limiting factors in current trade exchange operations are, and I wrote about this in my book, The End of Money and the Future of Civilization, devoted an entire chapter, chapter 15, to discussing these limiting factors. Right now, it's a limit on the scale and scope of operations, which are local, regional, and small. Now, I do believe that small is beautiful and we need to focus on the regional and the local, but we can't stop there. Uh, trade exchanges have failed to penetrate all levels of the supply chain. There's been an over-reliance upon the retail level for clients, and this is becoming increasingly troublesome in the current COVID crisis because those are the businesses that are suffering most and may fail uh, to recover. Isolated operation and lack of interoperability uh, has been a problem since the beginning. Exchange currencies are not equally valued. And this is probably the biggest problem. Many exchanges have excessive system debt and can be overly generous in allocating credit lines as a way of drawing new members into their exchange. And the other thing is offering clients exclusive or semi-exclusive access, which limits the size of the market. That is, if you have 10 restaurants already in your exchange, you might be inclined to say no more restaurants, but that in the long run is self-defeating. So the great opportunity here, and this is what I told you back in 2006, is to federate your current isolated local, exchange ex local exchanges into wide area networks that offer universally accepted moneyless payment. That is the process of credit clearing that Dr. Lee highlighted in her presentation. Uh, we need to provide seamless member to member trading. I know we have UC and UC does work but it's cumbersome. Uh, there's too many layers in between uh, members. Members have to be able to trade directly with one another. This will allow us to attract new user members in diverse locations and industries, open up new levels of the supply chain, promote standardization and shared branding, and reach a tipping point that allows your industry to grow exponentially. Now, talking about the supply chain, obviously, everyone wants to be able to pay their suppliers. So starting at the retail level, your retail clients need to be able to pay their wholesale suppliers. The wholesalers need to be able to pay the manufacturers that supply them. And the manufacturers need to be able to pay the basic commodity producers that supply the input to manufacturing. And of course, as was pointed out yesterday, uh, everyone has employees, contract workers, and these are the consumers that patronize the retailers completing the reciprocity circuit. So this is the key. We need to complete this reciprocity circuit and include all levels of the supply chain. Now I go beyond this and uh, I say it's also important to look as, at the network as a commonwealth. And uh, we have to look beyond our own personal and business self-interest 
we need to look at what supports the common good. And I'm arguing that all participants need to have a stake in this new economy, in this new exchange system. Not only exchange operators, but also the platform users, the business members of your trade exchanges, and the consumers that also form part of the reciprocity circuit. And I would add the community in which you operate, which is increasingly a global community, needs to have an equity stake in what's being done. And someone needs to represent the environment and the e ecological sustainability. Now, harking back to the old days of uh, credit card uh, emergence and the emergence of the unified brands of Visa and MasterCard, DHOC, who shepherded this process more than 50 years ago of bringing bank credit card issuers together under a common brand called Visa, he wanted the merchants and the cardholders to also be owner members along with the banks. But the banks were not willing to share, and thus we have a card duopoly that controls mostly uh, most of the credit card industry, that is Visa and MasterCard. And we still have a few others that have a minority stake in the industry. So I didn't know it at the time, but saw Paul Suplicio, who was the ERTA executive director uh, early on, he said much the same thing that I'm saying in his ERTA convention presentation in 2004, two years earlier than mine. He said, commercial barter cannot achieve its full potential with the current fractured organization of our industry. A single currency will unite all barter networks worldwide into a single network and transform our currently fractured industry into a strong and unified whole. Remember the rule, the larger the network, the more valuable it is to join and the more costly it is to stay out. Under a single global currency, all networks would have to agree to convert their balances to a single currency and clear their transactions through a single global clearinghouse. Now I know that that has been the major stumbling block and the things that the thing that has been hard for uh, trade exchange operators to swallow. But I think it's something that needs to be done. So what needs to happen now is, in my opinion, trade exchanges need to organize under a shared brand under an enabling organization. And this parallels the experience of the organization of Visa, which is a shared, ban, shared brand uh, that bankers use to issue their credit cards under. And same with MasterCard. And that enables participating trade exchanges to maintain a uniform high value currency in the form of trade credits to share innovations and to provide exchange of value capability more efficiently at less cost to a larger, more diverse member base. So the, the, the details of this need to be worked out, but that's the general outline. I also pointed out in 2006 what DHOC said in the heat of battle uh, that the banks were engaged in and pulling together to create Visa. He asked, could this be an opportunity to reconceive in the most fundamental sense the very idea of bank, money, and credit card? Now, I paraphrase that to our situation, saying, could this be the time to reconceive the very idea of barter exchange and payment to realize the full potential of decentralized moneyless exchange. 
So I've discovered in my own personal journey through life that change is often about letting go. I've had to let go of a lot of old things to make room for the new. Don't get stuck on a small local peak of success when the rest of the world is moving on. And we see that that indeed is more true now than it was uh, 14 years ago. To get from a hilltop to a mountaintop, you need to traverse the valley. So don't go it alone. Share the risk by growing an enabling network. And as George Gilder says in his book, Telecosm, you need to feed the network first. And by doing that, you feed your own interests. Again, I said in 2006, quoting the former Army Chief of Staff, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. And Charles Darwin reminding us that it is not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent, but the most responsive to change. So I invite you to be part of the movement toward re-empowerment that includes other sectors as well as the commercial trade exchange sector, private currencies and decentralized exchange networks in general provide homegrown liquidity, that is alternative means of payment, greater community resilience and self-determination. And I'm not talking only about geographic communities, I'm talking about communities of interest. And uh, they also provide insulation against global monetary instability and general financial collapse, which is actually happening uh, as we speak. It's not a sudden collapse like uh, uh, destruction and implosion of a building, but it's a gradual disintegration and falling to pieces. And greater harmony, equity, social justice, and quality of life for all. Uh, this is what we're aiming for. So you have it in your power to change the world and you can do well by doing good, by taking the wide scale view and helping the metamorphic change from the caterpillar to the butterfly. So here are some resources that you can consult and that concludes the presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. So uh, again, we have the resources beyondmoney.net, reinventingmoney.com, and escapingthematrix.org.